So next, um, we'll talk about credit risk, which is obviously for banks uh, the most important uh, type of risk they have. And oh, see, okay. And credit risk is a little bit more complicated than it seems. One would think that credit risk is just uh, the risk of losing money when you uh, take up a loan or give out a loan. So if a firm holds receivables from private persons or another firm, the firm is exposed to the possibility that the claims are not or only partially settled. So this is important. Any company, any sector is exposed to credit risk. If you are the manufacturer of a shoe company and you sell um, your shoes in wholesale, say to Lidl, Aldi, Kaufland, um, and what could happen is that uh, the retail store defaults. So you are the manufacturer of those shoes, you have delivered the shoes in wholesale, in Großhandel in German, and you have receivables. Sie haben Forderung, Auslieferung und Leistung. And you've already delivered the shoes, they, maybe they've already been sold, and the company who owes you money defaults, then you have credit risk. So that's credit risk, and sometimes we also call it counterparty default risk. Um, in German, we call this debtor default, or debt, no, a debtor risk, debitorenrisiko, uh, which is just um, showing that um, it is not credit risk, as you would find it in a bank, uh, but any company that um, delivers products before payment will be exposed to credit risk. So every time you have receivables from private persons or another firm, you will have credit risk. And the second thing we have to stress is that if those claims are not settled or if they're only partially settled, you will have credit risk. If you are owed 100 euros and someone only pays you 50, that is credit risk. You still get some part of your money, but you don't get all of it. So this all is credit risk. For banks, credit risk is obviously the most important type of risk banks are exposed to because their whole business model is based on granting loans, granting credit. So it should be noted that in the end, almost each firm is exposed to credit risk. Every time you have um, receivables, every time uh, you wrote money, you are subject to what we call debt risk or debitoren risiko. And depending on the industry in which a company operates, this type of risk will be more or less important. In some cases, for example, if you are offering, um, if, um, if you own a barber shop uh, and you offer to cut people's hair, there is virtually no um, credit risk because everyone pays upfront. Everyone pays immediately and you don't have any receivables. Um, if you think about car manufacturers, they sell a lot of cars, they have leasing, they, they sell a lot of com uh, cars to different uh, retail shops um, and so on. So they will have a lot of credit risk, actually, even though they are not a bank. In parentheses, you have to say, well, those car manufacturers often operate a bank, like, for example, Volkswagen Financial Services. That is, of course, is also a bank, but you can see that it's, it's not as clear cut and some manufacturing companies, some industrial companies will also have credit risk. So credit risk in the retail sector will only play a very minor role. In the case of energy supplies, energy companies who have receivables from electricity and gas bills from thousands of retail consumers from households, uh, debt to risk management will be regularly conducted in the same manner and the same with the same scope and style like in a bank. Why? Because you have thousands of household customers who take up electricity and gas and they all have to pay their bills. Now, next we want to make a fine distinction between credit risk in a strict sense and in a broader sense. In German, credit risk in engeren und weiteren Sinn. Credit risk in the strict sense is simply the risk that someone defaults or he or she does not default. One, zero. Default, no default. Credit risk in a broader sense is a continuum of probabilities starting at zero, no default, to one absolutely probable, sure default. And if this probability of default increases, if it worsens, you will have an increase in credit risk in a broader sense. Many times this 
type of credit risk will be measured by using ratings and scores. You will see that it's not just good, bad, but it's maybe 10% probability of default, 20% probability default, and so on and so on. So if this worsens, then you have credit risk in a broader sense. Um, this seems to be a rather academic distinction, but I can tell you this is actually not very academic, it's quite practical. In many cases where you have a bank that is um, um, active in retail banking and quite aggressively active in e retail banking, like for example, uh, Santander Bank, Targo Bank uh, in Germany, uh, maybe also SEB, where you have these banks that um, have a rather different business model than traditional private banks, um, then these banks will have huge portfolios of very small um, um, borrowers and they don't care about a single one having a decrease or increase in his or her default probability because they have such a huge amount of uh, small loans in a huge portfolio they're only looking at ones and zeros they are only looking at credit risk in the strict sense but at the portfolio level if, of course, on the other hand, you are a large bank, let's say you're a Commerzbank, Deutsche Bank, and you've given out a huge loan to, let's say, Wirecard, and you have a huge credit risk exposure with, with just one client, then, of course, the change in the probability of default with this client is much more important, and you do, actually the portfolio is the client, and then you need to look at credit risk in a broader sense. It doesn't make sense to make such fine distinctions in a huge portfolio of small borrowers, but uh, this is rather retail banking here, and this is rather um, corporate banking, where you have huge corporate clients. Then counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is also credit risk. Why? Um, We've seen that every time you engage, you enter a um, contract, it might be that you're owed money, that you need to deliver something. And if your contract partner in a loan contract um, or in a supply contract, if your client, if your business partner defaults, then you probably lose money. But it can be more delicate. Um, imagine you enter a financial contract uh, in which you rely on your business partner to do something for you or to pay in a certain situation, like for example an insurance company. If now your insurance company defaults, let's make a very practical example. You have a bike, you have bike insurance, anti-theft theft, theft insurance. Um, your bike is still there, but suddenly your insurance company defaults. Now if your insurance company defaults, you probably know, you don't the contract is void and you no longer need to pay your insurance premium. However, you have no theft insurance. If the company, the insurance company defaults now and your bike is stolen tomorrow and you don't have uh, an additional theft insurance, bad luck. You have counterparty risk. This is what we call counterparty risk, the risk that a counterparty in a business contract defaults. You don't need to have an immediate financial loss, but you're simply left without insurance. You are left without the desired uh, action on the part of your business partner, on the, your, on the other counterparty. This means that default risk uh, can also be counterparty risk. And you will have a financial loss because it could be that this type of Probably that's why the insurance company went bankrupt. If the insurance premium was very low for your theft insurance, for your bike insurance, you need to buy a different insurance contract. You need to buy insurance with a different insurance company and it might be more costly. You might have to pay a higher premium. Then, of course, you have an opportunity because you have a, you have a financial loss because you now have to pay more for your insurance contract. Counterparty risk is usually not that important uh, in in uh, uh, insurance, in the insurance business, um, because you also have reinsurance for the uh, primary insurer, so it's highly unlikely that an insurance company will default, but this is very, very uh, important in the business or in the trading of credit default swaps, especially, the, well, because it's OTC over the counter, and 
this is very important uh, with your trading partners uh, in energy trading. Okay, so let's start with the first one. I think it is, yeah, it is described on the next couple of slides. Um, I will do this without the slides, you can read them through, uh, but I want to explain this a little bit in detail because I think CDS contracts are quite interesting, quite important. And even though sometimes I'm criticized for this uh, in the evaluation, uh, if um, you're more of a Hollywood fan, it might be that in times of a pandemic you're uh, watching Netflix maybe right at this very moment during this lecture. So uh, if you were more interested in CDS contracts, like uh, have a look at Christian Bale buying a CDS in uh, The Big Short. That's what he does, uh, his character. He buys a CDS contract from an investment bank uh, in this movie The Big Short. Um, a CDS contract is what? Let's say, let's make this very, very, a little bit more fun. This is Christian Bale. He runs uh, a fund, investment fund. Okay. He sees an investment opportunity. He sees those nice little um, housing um, portfolios. And he sees that some banks large American banks have securitized those loans. They say, for example, um, you have a sub subprime mortgage, sorry, mortgage loans. And this is a security. Actually, this is a bank. This is actually a bond. So let's first look at this, how these securities came into existence. It's a process we call securitization. In German, Verbriefung. A very simple example for this is, um, now I'm a bank, I've given out a lot of loans um, to, I wouldn't say poor people, but I've given out uh, a lot of loans to people who are, were barely um, able to afford a housing purchase. So I see that actually these are a lot of loans. I have a loan portfolio in the subprime mortgage segment. And I want to sell this for whatever reasons. I, want, I need some liquidity. I want to sell this. Now, I can sell each and every loan by itself. That's very costly. I need to look at all those different loans. I need to find a contract partner who wants to buy every loan. But what I can do is I can put them all in a portfolio and then sell the whole portfolio to what? Let's say it's now it's getting a little bit complicated. So this is, let's say, City. City Bank decides to sell this loan portfolio. And what City does is it founds what we call a special purpose vehicle. A special purpose vehicle is nothing but um, a mailbox business, a mailbox firm, a briefkasten firma. Uh, actually. So the loans are sold to the SPV. The SPV now owns this portfolio of subprime mortgage loans. And the SPV sells the subprime mortgage loans to investors. Different banks who are interested in owning this portfolio because it offers a very high return. No? It's very lucrative. So the investors, okay, investors here the investors pay money and they pay to the SPV and the SPV now pays the money to Citi so Citibank has successfully sold the subprime mortgage loan portfolio the SPV is only founded on Bermuda Island islands, uh, on the Cayman Islands, etc., only to save taxes. So it's only meant uh, to be a purpose, a vehicle for the special purpose of selling off those subprime mortgage loans. The investors, they don't simply buy these mortgage loans, but what they do is they buy bonds from this special purpose vehicle. So they buy bonds 
uh, and maybe also different types of equity. So they are investors uh, as debt holders or equity holders in the SPV. And as a famous example, for example, in case of uh, EKB uh, in Germany, uh, they called one of their uh, conduits Rhineland funding. And that was the name of one of the SPVs, Rhineland funding, very nice name. So this is what happened before the financial crisis. A lot of banks sold off some of their mortgage loans, especially in the subprime segment, via SPVs, via securitization. This means that you take loans and uh, claims and you put them into securities and they are sold off to investors via a special purpose vehicle. Now, what can you do with a CDS? Now, let's go back to our investor, Christian Bale, in this case. I don't know the name of the character. He sees that this is rather uh, dangerous. It's quite risky. And what he does is he sees that the SPV might default. So it goes to usually a large investment bank, the investment bank, and he says, well, I want to buy insurance against the default of Rhineland funding. He doesn't have anything to do with city, the mortgages or Rhineland funding. He simply wants to buy default insurance against the default of the special purpose vehicle. And the investment bank says yes. And he has to pay a fee for that. So we have one arrow here. I hope it stays here. Yeah. And here. So this is the CDS contract. Christian Bale agrees. He agrees to pay, let's say, 4% on every dollar, on the, on the dollar, let's say, per year. And the investment bank says, okay, in case of default, um pay the dollar no default no payment so it's basically an insurance against the default of the spv rhineland funding and what christian bale then does is even though this is maybe um, he, he doesn't have to do with it doesn't have anything to do with the spv but he then says okay i want to buy 400 million your uh, dollars insurance and the investment bank says well we can do this so he now waits and he has to pay this fee to the investment bank dollar obviously here he has to pay the fee the premium but in the financial crisis at some point those defaults happened and he got the 400 million that's why his fund was generating a huge profit so he speculated against um, the default of these special purpose vehicles and he bought what we call a credit default swap because default risk is swapped. The default risk was with the fund and it's swapped to the investment bank for a price. So this is one and well we get to need to get back to um, the counterparty risk. If you remember that movie actually um, the same um, transaction was also done by the character of Steve Carell and he at some point realized that he had inadvertently and unknowingly bought the CDS protection from his own parent company and if the investment bank goes bankrupt you don't have the CDS contract you don't have any insurance and this is where we need to take a look at this U.S. to take over AIG, this is from the Wall Street Journal, U.S. to take over AIG in 85 billion bailouts, central banks inject cash as credit dries up, government seize control of American International Group, one of the world's um, biggest insurers in an 85 billion dollar deal that signaled the intensity of its concerns about the danger a collapse could cause um, post to the financial system. In addition, AIG was a major seller of credit default swaps, essentially insurance against default on assets tied to corporate debt. We've seen this. AIG was the largest worldwide largest insurance company and the insurance business wasn't the problem. The problem with AIG was it had sold so much credit default swap, it was a major counterparty in the CDS market. 
And the United States, the Feds, and the uh, U.S. government realized that if AIG had gone bankrupt, all those credit default swaps would have been void, and a lot of banks, a lot of funds would have been there without any insurance through those credit default swaps. So this is why um, counterparty risk is a huge, or in the financial crisis, was a huge uh, topic uh, in the CDS market. And the example with the trading partners in energy trading is basically quite similar. Um, you have um, trading in energy on a day-to-day -day basis, and you engage with partners who are sometimes rather small or mid-sized. And if you do hedging contracts, if you have hedging transactions with these energy partners, you have to rely on the um, probability that these trading partners will not default, because otherwise you will have to buy or sell energy at a very unfavorable price. So in this case, you need to check for the counterparty risk of those trading partners in energy trading. Okay, now this slide is, I think, now a piece of art, so let's move on. Um, we have several different subtypes of credit risk. Replacement risk from derivatives. Issuer risk, if you have a tradable debt or equity security, a bond or a share or stock, and the issuer defaults. You have fulfillment risk, risk that one contractual partner will not perform while the other already has performed its contractual obligations. Country risk, also sovereign risk, if a whole country defaults, this could also be uh, regarded as counterparty risk, but in many cases it's of course credit risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I have not mentioned, I only mentioned the abbreviation OTC, counterparty risk has a very special importance in non-exchange trading, so-called over-the-counter OTC trading. In OTC trading, transactions take place directly between two market participants and not via an intermediary of a stock exchange. So one advantage of OTC trading is that both contracting parties can negotiate arbitrary conditions. So for example, E.ON will look for maybe RVE or a large other company or an investment bank and they will not trade on an exchange. They will simply pick up the phone and do a very um, detailed individual contract rather than a standardized contract via an exchange. So stock exchanges, their trading is anonymous and standardized. ODC, it's a non-anonymous and individual. You can, um, you can do individual contracts. One disadvantage is, and that's the main advantage of an exchange, exchanges don't have counterparty risk because this exchange itself, for example, Deutsche Börse, guarantees that all those payments are settled and all those contracts are settled. In OTC trading, you have counterparty risk. And after the financial crisis, uh, regulators have tried to remove counterparty risk, at least in part, by establishing a central counterparty which takes over the so-called clearing for all market participants. You could ask yourself, what is clearing? Well, here's the definition. It's the entire procedure of settling a financial transaction, and in particular it includes the determination and settlement of mutual claims, liabilities, the delivery obligations, as well as the transmission and reconciliation of information that is relevant for the settlement. And as in OTC trading with central counterparties, the market participants do not enter into transactions directly with each other, but always indirectly via the central counterparty, the exchange, for example, or the clearing company. And thus, there should not be any counterparty risk. So we've seen the AIG case and that is counterparty risk and credit risk in general. And here is an example from uh, the industry. Again, you can see the credit volume, the loan volume, and the required risk capital uh, of DZ Bank. DZ Bank calls it risk capital. So we have economic capital, risk capital, regulatory capital, all the same basically. And you can see here that uh, they report and they disclose uh, the required risk capital for uh, those different segments for credit risk in credit risk management. Okay. Now let's shortly talk about liquidity risk at the end of this lecture. Um, and the risk we've seen so far, um, they are 
quite similar in the sense that they only had an indirect impact on the survival of a company. We saw that actually those companies, they have a financial loss, um, they have market, no, they have a change in market risk, they have a financial loss, but in the end, you, the companies will incur financial losses. You will never have a company that only generates profits uh, on a daily basis. On some days, some days you will lose money. You will have uh, market price changes. You will have uh, defaults in a loan portfolio. You will incur some losses. But these losses do not mean that you, the existence of your company, is affected in the first place. It simply might be okay my profit this year will be my net income will be slightly lower that's that's fine that's okay so so we have to talk about what could go wrong and what is the worst case scenario the worst case scenario is bankruptcy so one reason for the bankruptcy of a firm is as the term insolvency already implies the missing ability to regularly pay your bills your short term bills and although market price risk credit risk they will lead to financial losses they only become a threat in the scenario if the losses simultaneously lead to liquidity risk. That is, you can no longer pay your bills. So that is liquidity risk. And usually the liquidity of the firm is understood as the firm's ability to fulfill all due obligations at any given point in time. The company then obtains the ability to settle its short-term debt by retaining sufficient cash or short-term disposable assets, that is sufficient liquid funds. And the liquidity of the company is a basic prerequisite for its continued existence on the market. If it's not, if it's illiquidity, you will have to file for bankruptcy. If you do not do this, if you see that your company is bankrupt, if you can no longer pay your bills, but you're trying to uh, beat time, uh, and uh, to drag this out without filing for bankruptcy in the um, um, responsible insolvency court. Uh, this is uh, called delay in filing for insolvency, this is Insolvenzverschleppung, and this is a criminal offense uh, under German law, under any law system, I guess. So this is Insolvenzverschleppung. It's not a criminal offense to go bankrupt, but it's a criminal offense if you know this and you're dragging it out over time. So what is liquidity risk? Liquidity risk is the risk that a company firm has insufficient liquid funds to settle all short-term liabilities. And the liquidity risk can arise in two ways within a company. On the one hand, a large outflow of liquid assets from the enterprise, from the firm, can occur so that the servicing of liabilities or bills that are due in the near future is at least questionable. And on the other hand, even if liquid funds remain unchanged, it might be that the maturity the due dates of your bills change and you suddenly have to pay your bills before uh, you expected them to mature. So short-term demand for liquid funds increases unexpectedly and it is also possible that expiring loans may not be extended, they are not replaced by new loans. This is what we call refinancing risk, Refinanzierungsrisiko in German. And those are different uh, possibilities how you suddenly run out of cash. That's liquidity risk. Liquidity risk is, of course, of particular importance for banks because banks engage in what we call maturity transformation, um, Fristigkeitstransformation, uh, Fristentransformation, um, in its core business um, operations. Why? You take in short-term debt from your depositors and you give out long-term loans in uh, on your asset side. In German, Sie nehmen als Bank ja kurzfristige Spar- und Kundeneinlagen ein, auf den Sparbüchern, Girokonten, die sind jederzeit kündbar, üblicherweise, und Sie vergeben langfristige Kredite. So, if suddenly your customers come to the ATM and they massively withdraw short-term deposits, we get what we call a bank run, and then the bank might be bankrupt overnight because the assets cannot be sold so quickly. Bank runs usually represent, um, well, usually represents one of the main research fields in banking and financial economics. And it's also one of the main reasons why banks are regulated and supervised. And we've talked about this last semester in the introduction to banking. Now, for insurance companies, uh, liquidity risk usually plays only a minor role. Why? Because insurance companies have a steady 
inflow of insurance premiums every month and um, the claims they are very um, they are stochastic and uh, you usually do not see a sudden spike in the number of claims might be different in some cases for example in health insurance now during the pandemic yes of course uh, but in normal times you do not see such high spikes in claims so you don't have massive withdrawals of liquid funds and you have a steady inflow of liquidity through your premium payments so that's um, nice for uh, insurance companies but they also have much long-term investment in their asset management so of course yes they need to be careful in their asset and liability management liquidity risk of a firm is closely related to market liquidity why because if you see you have um, too little liquid funds you have to liquidate certain assets and for this you need the market for this asset to be liquid so you need market liquidity market liquidity is understood as the ease with which an asset can be bought or sold without the transaction having any influence on the market price of the asset and ideally an asset can be purchased or sold at its fair market value immediately and without affecting the market price if on the other hand security is not liquid you must accept a price reduction which we call a haircut or you have to wait so both things are possible if you have a wait if you have to wait a long time until the price is acceptable for you that's liquidity risk and missing market liquidity and if you want to buy or sell something and the price is not right uh, then that's also market liquidity missing market liquidity and thus market um, liquidity risk oh oh what is happening now I just jumped to the end of the lecture that's not good I think it was 105 okay why did this happen okay so let's look at market liquidity in practice um, the easiest way to measure um, the liquidity the market liquidity of an asset is via its bid ask spread and this is the stock of Deutsche Bank um, in German, we call this the Geld Briefspanne, the bid R spread. This is the difference between the prices for buying or selling this asset. This is the bid R spread. And as you can see, uh, for example, in the financial crisis, the bid R spread for the stock of Deutsche Bank, which is a blue chip stock, remember, uh, it went to almost uh, one euro. Very, very high. If you look at this in, as a relative bid R spread, relative to the price itself, it's almost 3% markup for liquidity. So uh, obviously during the financial crisis, everyone was trading in one direction. Everyone was trying to get out and selling the stock. So um, if you wanted to sell, you had to accept a haircut of almost 3% simply for liquidity reasons. Went down to less than 0.5% here, but during the financial crisis, uh, liquidity risk was quite uh, dramatic. Okay, and uh, well, you can see again here the absolute bid ask spread uh, in the financial crisis. And uh, yes, liquidity risk is closely related to market liquidity. The liquidity risk of a firm and market, uh, market liquidity are directly connected with each other. Why? Because if you see a decline in the liquidity of assets and securities that are held by a company, this will increase the company's liquidity risk or it could also trigger illiquidity why because if the market is not liquid you cannot sell your assets in short time and thus you're faced with the danger that if you are not able if you have um, uh, insufficient liquid funds you cannot fire sell your assets you cannot do a fire sale and then you have liquidity risk okay so I think uh, I'm almost uh, up with uh, my time for the day. So I would say we stop here um, before we start our discussion of operational risk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would say I will have a look at the chat uh, window right now. And if you have any questions, we can do this after I've stopped the recording. So have a nice week and have a nice day. Thank you.